we now have a fantastic panel and it's all about the transformation of the legal culture in the iGaming industry, specifically here in beautiful Malta. So our awesome panel of experts are now going to share their insights on the evolution of the legal framework, the importance of transparency and compliance, and how the industry can continue to raise the bar for legal culture in iGaming. I love a good pun, so I do. Yes. So please join me in welcoming to the stage. We got a quartet of awesomeness coming up. First up, we're going to welcome the founder and partner of WH Partners. Please give it up for Olga Finkel. Welcome, Olga. Fantastic. And Olga is joined by the general counsel at Betson, Kareen Valletta. Welcome, Kareen. And also the director of legal affairs at Bragg Gaming, Alma Meitlich. And then rounding up our quartet, we've got legal director at Push Gaming. Please give it up for Denise De La Reve. Merci. Fantastic. The stage is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. We finally got to the stage by the time we should close this panel. But fear not, we're still going to discuss our topic. And our topic is the corporate legal culture, which refers to the shared values and practices within the legal departments within the organization. And it also refers to the value the legal departments themselves hold within the organization. Corporate legal uh, culture um, embraces and promotes establishing of ethical standards within the organization and influences also how legal uh, risks are dealt with and how professionals, legal professionals, actually contribute to the overall objectives and missions of organization. And the strong legal culture, strong culture um, promotes transparency, accountability uh, within the organization. So how strong is the corporate culture within our industry, within our gaming? Well, as a lawyer in private practice, I've been supporting the industry for over 23 years now. It's a big number, <laughs> scary sometimes. Um, but I recall that maybe 20 years ago, when a client would come from any other industry, regulated industry, the main question about specifics of the industry would be, please tell me what the rules are and how do I do my business without breaking them? But I recall very clearly that in those early days, when an executive from iGaming company would come, more often than not, the question or the request rather would be, please tell me how not to get caught. This is something that struck me and shocked me at the time. To our uh, participants in this panel, in-house counsel within the gaming industry, you joined from different paths, uh, different routes, B2C, B2B, uh, later, in more recent years. How have been your first experience when you joined the industry? Have you been shocked with something as well? How were your expectations and what did you find on the inside? Denise, you, you joined the industry in uh, 2018, I believe, and you came from the private practice. How was your transition? Yes, yeah, so um, just to give sort of the background. So I came from uh, consultancy law firms. I worked for some of the global law firms. And obviously, as you can imagine, the standards there are very high. You have uh, very demanding clients. You have very professional legal departments coming to you, and they expect you to essentially be better than them. There is no uh, room for wiggle, no room for risk. There is no room for error. So your advice needs to be top-notch and needs to cover all kinds of risks, actual or potential. And when I moved to the industry, uh, it was a bit of a shock for me. Uh, I believe partially it's because of the transition from consultancy to in-house. But there were things that really struck me. And to be fair, some of the things that shocked me or struck me were related to stories I've heard. How th if you think this is bad, you should know how it was five, ten years ago. Um, so I started piecing things together and, you know, stories about people signing agreements that had no authorization to sign them. Um, agreements not getting reviewed by legal at all. Um, all kinds of um, shocking things at the time. And obviously there was, um, the motivator was commercial, uh, let's make money, let's not, you know, waste too much time reviewing contracts, uh, just make it happen. If there's a risk, flag it, but that's about it. So it was a huge transformation for me to sort of be able to put myself on the other side and um, get on that mode of strictly business thinking and limiting the review, limiting my work to what is essential. Um, it took some time to getting used to, and I think it also depends very much on what kind of company you work for. 
Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll come to that. Yes, later, yes, yes, I don't want to get ahead Corinne, of myself. Corinne, you had a, a different experience. You first joined the industry as, as by joining the regulator in yes. 2011, I believe, and then you move into in-house uh, position in 2017. How has been your transition from one to the other? Uh, were people around you surprised that you chose this industry in the first place? Exactly. So, so my, um, my, my journey as such has, I mean, I, I hear some things from what Denise is saying. And um, uh, when, I joined, when I first joined the, the industry officially, let's say, but when, when I joined the, the regulator, uh, that was 2011, um, it was a, a very different time um, to, to, to a very large extent. Um, and I do still remember a little bit of what you said in your intro that, um, you know, let's, let's see how we can kind of get away with it. And you would, if you're not smart enough, working at the regulator you would be you would very quickly you know pick pick that up from the from the industry um, but then uh, things have progressed things have moved on the um, uh, just as you know operators have become smarter and smarter I, I believe so have regulators um, and then um, we I think we are in a different uh, very different time actually at the moment a very interesting challenging time for uh, both operators and regulators but if I just have to stick for, for now to my personal experience coming from regulator to, to operator for the purposes of this question I would say that um, there was a lot of the same I didn't have the the the, the shock that Denisa had from the, the consultancy industry, from the consultancy side, because um, I was effectively an in-house lawyer with the regulator, then to the operator, it was the same industry, so that was all similar. Um, the speed, however, the speed at which you're expected to find solutions, that's a totally different story. Um, uh, the, um, the pressure you are under on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, not only are you in-house, I, I think this would be characteristic of most in-house councils any, any, in, a, in other industries as well, but when you couple that with the gaming industry and the profile of the gaming industry, how competitive it is, how you know, brutal it is when you get out there. I mean, I was expected, you know, within the, my first week um, on the job that I, I actually, you know, propose solutions without even knowing enough about uh, Betson at the time. You know, obviously yeah. I was still, I was just jumping into the fire. So, so yeah, I would say that was the main thing that okay. took me back when I did my, my first move. How was it for you, Alma? You joined from the three participants in this panel the latest, 2020, yes. and you joined the B2B operators. How, how has it been for you? Have you had less shocks, perhaps? Have you been moved positively over the years? What do you think? Well, I can draw a lot of comparisons uh, with what has been said already. So, like you said, I, I joined the, the business uh, uh, BREC, the industry, in 2020. Um, maybe you know, adding to what was already said, perhaps the biggest shock for me was that the scope of the industry itself. So uh, coming from um, a conti con the continent, uh, sp Slovenia more specifically, you know, general public is not even aware of this industry there. So um, it was perhaps for me the biggest shock, shock was the scope and the volume, the speed, everything. We were, I was used to, um, you know, being involved in the regulated industries before in uh, uh, investment banking and finance uh, uh, realm, but um, basically this was, you know, the fast-paced environment and uh, basically this industry uh, has been a new thing for me. Uh, we knew about uh, uh, BRAC in this like small circle of M&A corporate lawyers in Slovenia because we knew about the transaction, so basically the acquisition of uh, formerly Oryx by Breck at the time, but it wasn't something that was part of the public perception that there is one of the le leading uh, B2B uh, software providers that has offices in Slovenia. It was, this was not part of you know, uh, us being aware. So I joined also at a very interesting uh, time, I must say. So it was just after the acquisition, but before we really restructured the business to um, you know, uh, in line with the consolidation under BREC. So basically that was the opportunity uh, and we took that opportunity to take a hard look at ourselves as a legal department as well. What can we do to step up uh, to the challenge? And uh, we did uh, just that. 
uh, basically we uh, uh, restructured the department, reassembled it, enhanced the compliance function as well, and we basically came up with something leaner and capable of meeting the demands of the industry. And we also took the challenge of leading by example at the time to basically transfer the, the industry from, from a more kind of, you know, startup culture to a more mature corporate business. Right. That's, that's a very interesting point. So basically when the professionals move in, it's very clear that you start driving the change from within, especially when you had the legal departments, you drive uh, the positive, the strong legal culture from the within. Uh, but in my experience, uh, Another thing that drives this uh, change, so to speak, is uh, the attitude of the top management. You mentioned it depends on the company, the attitude of the top management. I recall many years ago, 20, maybe 15 years ago as well, some conversations with in-house counselors at the time. And uh, what struck me in this, that uh, sometimes quite, quite a few of them were frustrated or uh, depressed even, because they would say, I'm not valued in my organization. Nobody hears me out. Nobody values my opinion. Sometimes they ask, but nobody follows it. So early on, uh, as far as I can recall, more or less the attitude was, let's act today, let's money, make money today, and we'll decide tomorrow how to deal with it, okay? Make hay while the sun shines, and we don't care about, about tomorrow. Um, Corinne, has this attitude changed, what you see in the industry today? Uh, is it still, uh, let's uh, do first thing later, or let's plan it properly, ask a legal department to assess, and then implement it? In other words, does inside uh, in-house counsel today have a seat at the decision-making ta uh, table? Most, most definitely. I mean, uh, sustainability has, is, is key, right? It's, it's the, the latest buzzwords. And sustain, uh, having a sustainable business has become the, the, the most important thing. I mean, I myself sit, sit in Betson, you know, a large, a large B2C company, uh, largely a B2C company. And uh, we obviously take a lot of um, pride, you know, in being in the business for a very long time. And so the only way you can stay there for a very long time is that you are uh, making sustainable business decisions. So I have seen a bit of a journey, um, if I have to generalize about the industry um, of kind of compliance and, and legal matters being a sort of necessary evil, a kind of checkbox that you need to go through before you um, get, and sometimes, you know, they forget about you and you find out some, about something too late or whatever, um, to a time when, yes, we are, I am part of the decision-making process. Um, I know about something before it actually becomes um, um, a, a business, you know, um, uh, decision or, or, or we, we know all the risks before we actually take that leap. Um, and uh, I, I I, I see it, I, I think even when I talk to other operators, um, even smaller operators, I know that this is, this is the way it is mostly being done um, out there. It, we can't afford it anymore. I mean, gaming has become, no matter, you know, I always, I, I always say that um, no matter how much we, uh, you know, we think it's fun, you know, to be in the gaming industry, you know, it's all, it's all, um, it's online, it's cool, it's modern, it's, it's fast, it's dynamic. Um, but really and truly, I mean, we, I mean, Betson holds over 20 licenses. There is no way that you cannot, you, you cannot, um, make compliance part of your inner gaming culture. You, you just won't make it. It will be, it will be a matter of, of, you know, months, if not weeks, that you, everything will come down. Thank you, Corinne. Alba, what is your experience in this? Once in-house counsel is actually at the seat, has a seat at the table, decision-making table, how does it change the culture within the whole organization? Yeah, so barring the back, uh, bad actors perhaps in the, in the industry, yeah, like I can agree that the whole industry has taken a shift, uh, shift towards a more uh, sustainable business organization, more sustainability, that I completely agree with what Corinne said. And uh, perhaps especially in this changing business environment where sometimes, you know, the profits are less and you have to chase them, um, it is, you know, the companies are seeking also competitive advantage in, you know, finding solutions that are more com uh, compliant, better products, you know, more care for the players and so on. So there is definitely a lot to be said in, in that direction. Um, I mean, Bragg being a, 
publicly listed entity, and we do have a management with a long track record, you know, across various jurisdictions. Um, we are lucky in that way um, that they completely understand the risks involved in terms of legal and reputational. And yeah, like exactly like Corinne said, there is actually no, no other alternative. Right. Um, so yes, that, that's extremely important. But I would also emphasize that perhaps first and foremost, it's the legal department's job. It's not the management job's to, job to understand the legal and compliance aspect. So basically, it's first and foremost on us to really make sure uh, that the decision making is informed. So that we really understand that uh, basically they are taking into consideration everything that we see. So we really have to sometimes be really, you know, smart in really painting the picture. Like, okay, decision, you know, there is a certain decision on the table. What does it mean? Maybe, yes, okay, business will survive tomorrow because, you know, taking a certain decision. But what does it mean for the business along the line in three years, in five years, perhaps? Um, so, yes, basically, we, we do take the responsibility or we should take the responsibility for that part, I, I think right. so. Well, it seems that with the development of the industry and with, you know, upgrading ourselves uh, and putting our uh, standards higher, uh, it seems to me that the industry very much becomes similar to any other regulated industry when the legal department in size, competence, complexity is, you know, depending on the size of the business and the legal risk profile of the business. But at the same time, uh, all this complexity and growth uh, creates uh, difficulties and, and managing this legal department. And uh, not only do you have to manage the legal department, but also you have to keep track of all the deadlines you have. Um, and, and you have to be proactive and pro-business. You can't really say, which is the easiest thing to say by a lawyer, you cannot do this. This is not, this is not uh, what the business is looking and expecting from us. Denisa, how do you manage all these uh, different uh, um, aspects? So I think it's uh, essential what uh, the ladies here mentioned as well, that you have the support from the, from the company, from the management. So it all goes from the top. So if you have the trust uh, and you have the acknowledgement from the management uh, of the importance of the legal and compliance issues, it's much easier to sort of do your job and be efficient at the same time. And of course, all the other departments have to buy into this idea. So if, you know, if this all comes from the management and you get the commercial teams and the marketing teams on board, um, it makes it very, very easy. I mean, relatively easy. And I, I think I'm very lucky at Bush Gaming that we have set the bar from the beginning um, very, very high, although we, we were a small company and still are comparably uh, smaller than some other players out in the market. But one of the reasons why I enjoy working there is that the, the, there, there are no compromises. And we reflect that in our hiring processes. We are very transparent in what we expect. We know that not all the companies out there have that bar perhaps, um, and so we want to make sure that everyone sort of buys into that idea and that makes it possible for me to manage all the complexities, as you mentioned, because I know that my sales team will support me. I know that our commercial director will understand and sort of fight for my idea and, and so on and so forth. So I think it's essential that the, it's made a value of the company as a whole and that value is... Um, followed by all the teams and the departments. Right. Well, complexity and growth of the legal department has another aspect, the cost that comes with it. And uh, in my experience, a long, uh, you know, long ago early, but not, not, uh, not present today as well, is that sometimes the organization sees the cost of the legal department and legal cost in general as unnecessary burdens and non-productive costs, and they just want to get rid of it as much as possible. Uh, how do you manage uh, your budgets to make sure that they're not viewed as burdens on the organization? At the end of the day, you're protecting the back of the company, right? Exactly. So that's what I remind them, basically. So they tell me, you're a cost center, you have to keep it down. I tell them, but we have licenses. Without our licenses, we don't come to work in the morning. And they shut up. But the truth is that it's true. It's um, a very, um, it's challenging kind of to keep it going both, um, bo bo both ways. I mean, obviously, we have, you know, a pretty, pretty large legal department, and that has 
has a lot of positives because that means there are, I've got a mix of, you know, uh, people with different expertise, people with different languages, which has become so important. And so that in itself makes it um, more possible to avoid certain external costs, you know, but the external costs, unfortunately, are always going to be there uh, because, you know, of the litigation in local countries, for example, experience you want from other consultants. So the best way is what you said, you know, you, you, you do manage and you prioritize. You prioritize what you really need, you know, this year. If you have a certain budget on, on, on certain issues, you, you need to, you know, let go on certain other areas, unfortunately, even if they're kind of nice to have and, you know, it would be fun to have, you know, this memo about this country and to know what we can do over there. But you, you let it go if you think that it's going to, you know, um, mean that you can't get a certain, certain approach, certain advice in, in something right. which is more crucial to the business. Okay. Well, let's look at the regulatory side, at the regulation of the industry, regulatory framework. I mean, we, we've seen, I've seen for sure, uh, it's moving from practically non-existent, uh, no rules or grey rules or vague rules. And now we are at a stage where we have maybe too many rules. There are too detailed rules, very prescriptive rules. Every minute detail of everything we need to report on and, and do is prescribed to us. I mean, on one hand, it's a good thing because things are more explicit. We know what to do, what is expected from us. But on the other hand, and I'm sure all lawyers will agree, it's impossible to have any set of rules that would never, ever, ever require any interpretation. At some point, you will need to see whether it's this way or that way and possibly discuss with the regulator what approach is better to have and come to a particular, you know, common solution. Um, I, I come to you, Corinne, as well, as a, as a B2C in-house counsel and working in many jurisdictions. So how do you manage this process? Because I think talking to the regulator is probably very much influential how the legal culture develops. What are the good to have approaches and what are unhelpful ones that you've seen? Yeah. Um, well, the challenge has been trying every time, like getting it right with every regulator, which has a different, you know, nationality, different culture, different, different approach. And you don't immediately realize um, what that, that, that regulator is all about and how that regulator needs to be approached, unless perhaps you have a local partner and then you maybe will have a little bit more insight. Um, the, 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 the trick part is, you know, once you get that down, then you've got to... Um, to translate it, so to say, for the business, because the business is usually, you know, a little, a few degrees removed from the communication with the regulator. So it will be difficult to explain to them, you know, why we need to do things in a certain way. Why, um, with the MGA, for example, to mention one, like we do things, um, we, we do things this way because this is how, you know, it has always worked with the MGA. But then we're going to a new regulator in Latin America, for example. That is not how they want to do things. That is, that is, um, they don't want such an open, for example, um, line of communication. They want, they want it to be a little bit more uh, formalized, a little bit more official. They need an official letter. Sometimes it needs to be signed. Actually, originally, you know, you need to uh, send documents in, in writing and stuff. So that that um, uh, so so getting that right is is I, I would say one of the the biggest challenges when there are so many regulators who you know talk to each other on how they want to regulate you, but not how they they actually um, you know get get uh, business done fast that that is not that is not the forte unfortunately in um, fact when we were preparing for the session you mentioned actually that some regulators told you do not communicate yes. with us yeah <laughs> we've received this a couple ultimate. of emails please don't send any more emails <laughs> yeah, okay um alma what is your experience in dealing with Maltese regulator versus maybe others that you've dealt with yeah in comparison to what we just heard uh, i think very positive overall uh, we really appreciate this open door policy that they have established and we are in communication with them on a regular basis on various issues and we always have this, you know, feel of yes, we are all in the same boat uh, approach and this is like, it's, it's immensely appreciated, yes, and we, because like was, it was mentioned, we do have other experience as well, like for example, regulators that only want to deal in formal written communication or you know, sometimes you deal with a more apprehensive, uh, so regulator, regulatory body that is more appre apprehensive to the, towards the industry. It might be due to, I don't know, lack of knowledge or, you know, politics, various reasons. And then you have to, you know, usually engage an external counsel to send an anonymous general query. And, you know, you might not get the best results. I think that this open door policy really promotes, uh, promotes compliance and, you know, 
this is how we get the best solutions uh, done. And there's only also one thing I would like to mention, which we are also really ap uh, appreciate about this uh, Maltese framework, is the recognition and understanding of the aggregation business. Uh, so basically, Bragg being, uh, you know, an aggregator, this is not just a given in any, uh, you know, in all other uh, regulations. Basically, this horizontal approach towards the regulating the B2B side, this has helped us on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis immensely. It's not, like I said, it's not necessarily regu um, recognized in other jurisdictions. Right. Well, talking about regulation, there is another, at least one other aspect of it, is that, you know, we, we, we came to the point where we have very detailed multiple rules, multiple sets of rules, even though they are kind of the same, but not really the same. Same, same by different, <laughs> they say, right? Mm. Um, but if we see, and I think we do agree that we see, that the legal culture in the industry has really stepped up. We are not uh, cowboys or unruly teenagers anymore. Then aren't we supposed to be there and, and do things more uh, in a free way? Why should we be forced to have everything prescribed in the menu details and we have to waste literally our limited resources on things which may possibly not even matter much? Why shouldn't we focus on what matters most? How do we deal with this with the regulators? Denisa, what, what do you think? Where does it come from? Why, why is it like this? Is it because the regulators don't trust us? They don't understand what needs to be done? Why is that? What do you think? I think uh, it could be very well related to what we discussed at the beginning. So I think they might be stuck in that era where, you know, things were not done properly, let's say, or there were some uh, cutting corners going on. And uh, of course, the, we know that the industry has made a huge progress. Um, um, we know we have stepped up and uh, we have professional legal departments and we take things very seriously. But I'm afraid that the regulators have not always realized what happened and they, they, they still have the old ways of thinking. So I think there's a lot of mistrust for sure plays a major role. I think it could also be partially down to some of the regulators not having enough professional staff that actually understands the problems from a practical point of view as well. It's not just theory. I mean, it's, it's like having um, a judge sitting on, on a panel deciding a case, a commercial dispute, but if they never actually worked in the business and they don't understand the business, um, it's very likely they will render a bad uh, judgment. So it, it's a little bit like that, I think. And then, of course, um, as I think Alma mentioned, we need that open door policy. We need to, to talk, be able to talk to the regulators more. They need to see us as the same people like they are. I mean, we are all lawyers, so we should be a bit more in direct communication and have re removed that barrier. We are the regulator and you are the business and we are the police and you need to comply with our rules. I think we need to loosen up that a lot. Right. And that's of course, a huge job. Right. We are basically running out of time, but I would like to see where we're going from here. I think we can all pat ourselves at the back because we have contributed to the improvement and upgrading of the legal culture in this industry. But where do we go from now? Can we just stay as we are? Should we improve? I guess we should improve because there is always room for improvement. So if I ask you to focus as concluding remarks for this panel on one important thing that you think is important and will drive further improvement of the legal culture, what would that be? Corinne. Um, I think the, the industry has really matured, you know, the, the cultures have matured, the, the regu um, regulation has matured and regulators have matured. And I think we should use that to our advantage. I think we should be um, open with regulators. I think we should, um, you know, the few, Alma mentioned, you know, maybe, you know, there are still some bad actors out there and that unfortunately, you know, taints the, um, the, the perception, so to say. So, so if we are more open um, with regulators, I really feel that um, the... I would say overregulation that we we are in the the conundrum of overregulation that we are in at the moment is I would, you know, partly symptomatic of the fact that regulators weren't fully understanding for a long time about how to regulate. So, you know, you put in extra rules just in case, you know, something gets missed. Um, that's not the way to go, but obviously we are in this place now and they need to step back. So I think if we are open with regulate, re regulators and them with us, you know, taking that, that um, kind of open door, um, like listen to us, we listen to you, um, so to um, approach, I think, I, th I think we can go to the next level of, of what this industry is, is all about and what makes it so so great. Great. Alma. Yes, yeah, so I like to focus on things I can control. 
right? Okay. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's basically communication from our end. So, and it's not only towards the regulator, it's not only towards the management, it's with our colleagues in development, it's with our colleagues in sales and so on. So, uh, and this basically helps us to, to get our insight even, you know, down the, the product line at the time of the development. That's one thing. And also communication across, you know, the other in-house departments uh, uh, within the industry. For example, like Malta is really special in a way that it's a really small, tightly knit community of experts. Perhaps, you know, in terms of broadening this and sharing this knowledge, it might make sense, I don't know, to have like a local in-house council, uh, you know, association of gambling lawyers. Uh, and this could basically be an open door also for experts such as myself that do not reside here. Uh, right. and could join uh, in discussion. I mean, I'm really happy that I've been invited to join this panel and meet these lovely ladies and, you know, exchange views. So I would continue doing what we can control and what we already did good to, to bring the industry to, to this, its current position. Excellent. Denisa. Um, I think the one thing uh, I think we should focus on is to open up the industry to influence from other industries. I think we're still seen as a pretty much separate industry. Um, some could say a bit shady, depending on where you come from. Um, and I think by uh, inviting uh, experts and you know peers from other industries to the debate, um, um, getting inspired and learning from their mistakes, because I could name, for example, the tobacco industry, which at the time was where they were the bad guys. Um, and, um, and they somehow managed to turn that image around. And I think there's just a lot that we can learn from other industries who may have been through a similar sort of journey, uh, being the bad guys and then, you know, um, turning the public perception and the, the way the authorities view them um, to their um, favor. So I think I would say let's talk to other industries, let's have conferences where uh, that are not dedicated to gaming only, but uh, tech, any sort of um, related industries. And I think eventually that will uh, open up to the regulators as well that should not isolate themselves from other regulators. Same thing. So um, I think if we combine all these three initiatives, it could actually <laughs> bring us somewhere. Lots of things to do, lots of work ahead. Thank you so much for a very insightful, uh, engaging discussion. Thank you for the panel. Thank you. We're close on Thank that. You. Thank you.